Thank you very much, Zamir Mohammed. Oh, Professor Daya Narayan Singh, president of UTT. My co-host, I could say by now, uh, Atlantic LNG, Carolyn Tony Sergi Ram Narayan and Marlon Grant, who I had the pleasure to meet on the weekend in Point Fourteen. And Marlon, um, these instruments were a far change from what we experienced <laughs> on the weekend. I am, I believe, one of the few ministers of government with a single pan side and a rhythm section as part of my team. So I think I should be talking to UTT about adding some horns <laughs> to it. Um, graduates and your families, all invited guests, good morning. Um, the last graduation I missed because my boss needed me to be somewhere else. The launch of this cohort I missed because my boss needed me to be somewhere else. And if we had continued in the Senate any longer this morning, I would have had to miss this. But I always tell people, I turn down, I, I respond to about 2% of the invitations I get. I only go somewhere to speak if I have something new to say or if I want something. <laughs> and I think both Atlantic LNG and UTT know what I want. I'd, I'd expand on it as I go along. So I'm happy to be here to ask for all the various things that I need on your behalf. Uh, my attention was drawn to the name Kyle Neptune among the list of awardees today. And right away, I remembered the story. In March, Kyle was tending to his farm in Moruga alongside two other young men from Moruga. And Kyle was unfortunately killed. Um, I would deeply regret my condolences to his family. We, we not only regret his death, and his absence, but the circumstances of it. So I want to say thanks to UTT and Atlantic LNG. Um, this program is one that caught my attention during my long and possibly successful election campaign. I wanted it right away to go on tour in rural Trinidad because I experienced firsthand the the challenges. When Zamir showed me this program, I said to him, but the people who really need this program are way out there on the East Coast. They don't have the facilities to attend, even for one day a week. Because throughout the election campaign, I said on the question of education, that there's one thing standing in the way of education opportunities on the East Coast and that is transportation. It's not lack of programs of, or lack of interest of lack of, of potential. It is purely lack of transportation. So that while I continue to commend UTT and Atlantic LNG, I continue to talk to them about having this particular program offered in Southeast and Northeast Trinidad. Except that this time around, you know, the ministry is in a position to put some resources forward. So I'm looking forward to that. And my my idea for the east east side of Trinidad is that I recognize that in the secondary schools, many of the teachers who teach agri-science are actually trained to do that. In the primary schools, it's more, more likely than not the teacher who could take more sun than anybody else or who has more time on his or her hands than anybody else, or who has more of a passion than anybody else. And um, in looking at Northeast and Southeast Trinidad, I've, I've said to Zamir in some of the preliminary discussions we've had recently, um, I see a combination of if, uh, young, young people and older people who are farmers or would-be farmers 
and teachers who are working in the primary school system uh, forming the, the cohort if, when we manage to take this program out on the road and into different, those two different parts of Trinidad. I think that um, it would enhance the primary school curriculum significantly based on other discussions I'm having with primary schools across the country about what we as a ministry could do to support learning uh, on agriculture and fisheries. So that's the first point I want to make. The second thing I, I want to say is that as I go through this country, and you know have gone through over and over, all over, I am not worried about the older farmers, and I'm not worried about the production capacity of this this country. I, I think that um, the older farmers have, have done well. They understand farming and they understand food production. They understand all the techniques and so on. There are areas in which, of course, they need support. And um, I think they understand, too, that farming is not business, but it is big business. And of course, when you go to the market to buy, everybody's bawling about, you know, not doing well and catching hell and all of that, but that's not the reality for, for many of them. So I'm not worried about the older farmers. I'm worried about you, the younger ones. The ones who come to me all over and say, I need five acres of land for agriculture. Are you in farming? No, but I want to get into farming. And what are you going to do with the land? Well, I'm going to go into agriculture. And what are you going to plant? Well, I don't know yet. You tell me. So that is very wor worrisome. Because this business is not an easy business. In fact, it may be one of the most difficult um, areas to get into to make a living in this country because you face it on all sides, uh, pests and diseases, an extremely uncooperative and unsupportive ministry, and it's been like that for a long time. You face a lot of silos and lack of information and lack of sharing. And the ravages of God, whatever you call your God. So I've just come through the pain of having to do with hot sun and dry conditions and bushfires and so on, straight into the pain of having to deal with rain and floods and the flood compensation that would follow. So that agriculture and fisheries and making a living this way is fraught with difficulties and challenges, some made by man and some sent to us by God. And that is where you are setting out to operate. And I'm not sure the extent to which we appreciate the need for risk management and planning and understanding how to deal with the realities of earning a, a living in this way. For that reason, and I always say when I talk to young people and when I, I talk on the subject of education, it's been a long time. I've been a, a lawyer and accidentally the first lawyer to be Minister of Agriculture. Um, I've been a lawyer for 21 years. It's been a long time somebody has asked me for my law school certificate or law degree or whatever. It's been a very, very long time People, anybody has asked me. Uh, my own career has been built on mentorship and being mentored by the right people at the right time. And I think that, that this business of agriculture is perfect for that form of uh, uh, mentorship, hand-holding by more experienced and more seasoned farmers and entrepreneurs. I think that succession planning in agriculture has been a big issue. People have complained that um, younger members of families are not interested in getting into farming. I think our, our government policy has a line in there about facilitating succession planning in farming. And I think that um, it's a very important thing that as young people, especially young people armed with a piece of paper saying we're bright, we overlook the, the potential of, of working with more experienced hands uh, on the job uh, before being given our feet to stand on and our wings to fly. I think that is, that is the approach I would recommend. It. I, I think that um, 
part of succession planning and part of your success is this issue of land tenure. Um, as I've said across the country, I think we, we treat farmers in a way that is different from other businessmen. We recognize the need for collateral by all other forms of business and assets. But when it comes to farming, we do not recognize the need for farmers to have that document that gives them security of tenure, that gives them a bankable asset, and gives them the opportunity to do long-term planning. So that's a, com that's a responsibility I have as minister to deal with this issue of land tenure. And I'm hoping soon enough you will see me handing out some of these leases that have been knocking around, um, waiting to be given out for 30 to 40 years. I think that land tenure is at the bedrock of this business of farming, and um, succession planning is at the heart of the success over the long term. The third thing I would say is, is what I say to all, all um, graduates of all types. I've had the pleasure of being both a university lecturer and a student. Um, there was a time when I was both at the same time. And I've seen graduates across the country regard a certificate as a demand for increased wages or a demand for increased op opportunity. The most vexing thing you could hear as a potential employer is, I have a and then you hear a long list of academic achievements. I think people are more interested in what you can do. And nowhere it is, is it best, better demonstrated than in this business of, of farming. As we get into the rainy season, for example, we have a yard at the ministry that I don't think in its history has ever borne fruit, literally. I don't think anything expect, except flower plants have been planted there. So I'd be happy for a young or not so young graduate of this program to come and plant the entire yard with pak choy and spinach and pimento and reap and keep 90% of it, leaving the other 10% for me. <laughs> and that, nothing would, would better demonstrate all that you have learned in this program than something as simple as that. All there for the whole country to see. I think that beats any certificate. And both as an employer and as somebody who is in recruitment because I have to look for stuff and I'm not very successful at it, I think that what you do is far more than what a certificate says you can do or you might be able to do. Um, the fourth thing I want to say is throughout, it, it's very painful to see resources being um, misapplied in, in our country. This is a country, now as a minister, when I get, get a different view of how much we spend, we waste a lot of money in this place through duplication. There's so many ministries and so many entities offering training in the same thing. Um, what that does is that it induces, throughout the campaign I talked about stipend grabbers and program hoppers, people who jump from program to program without completing one, especially in rural communities, and people who jump from program to program because one program offers $5 more as a stipend than the other one, so they jump around, and they never really finish anything. And all many of these trainees are, are just a check-off box to say we trained 45 people in booze, in food preparation. And what it contributes to the community or to the national economy is something that is, is unknown. Um, and that is across ministry and across the country, so many silos where people meet very quietly and talk about things as though we're still in the days, you know. Senator Mark, I think, in the Senate yesterday talked about hit Hitler and took me, took me back a century. But, you know, see secret societies that we, we, um, we have in the country where we do research in that corner very quietly, maybe in the same dark space that Professor Narayan Singh talked about. 
and um, and keep it a secret that we do some innovation in that corner and 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 there's very little integration and when I spoke to the cocoa sector a few months ago at UWE, I talked about convergence, cohesion, and collaboration. They need to bring all this information together in one place, um, determine how we're going to keep it together, and determine how we're going to collaborate going forward. So, Because all of this is, is, is meaningless. Research into cocoa, research into germplasm, research into plant varieties is, is meaningless unless it is contributing something to a farmer, and that something will cause a farmer to sustain production and increase the income that his production is bringing to his family. It is meaningless, and sometimes we get caught up with the excitement of the talk and the fascination with the academic paper, and we forget what lies at the end, the end of it all. And what lies at the end of it all is that you've been in the space of three months from, let us say, May 22nd, when I could give you possession of the site of the ministry, May 22nd to August, you've been able to plant X number of, um, you know, pak choy or whatever. Uh, this is your cost of production because I'm not helping you with any of the inputs. And this is your, your gross sales and this is your profit and then, of course, my 10% is, is, is taken in kind. That is, that is, that is how, it, how it matters, and too, too many times. When I talk about coconut or cocoa or, or fisheries or any, anything, there's always some think tank over so and some research group over so and some, and the poor farmer <laughs> in the middle there catching hell and not seeing the way. Um, the fifth thing I would say deals with young people in particular. We assume that young people are more tech savvy. In my home, I don't see evidence of that. Um, we assume that you're more innovative. Um, this business of farming, what, what I've, there's, a, there's an industry, I believe, a, a subsector that has developed on the simple thing of communication. Because, of course, it's easy to tell people to do plant a backyard garden or do a grow box at home. But, you know, how many people really, how many working people have time to go out to Centeno on a Tuesday from 10 a.m. to 11 or to 1 p.m. to learn how to plant pak choy in a grow box or whatever? I mean, people do have the time. So communication, I mean, I, I'm not addicted to YouTube uh, videos. But I'm a fan of anything that is about one minute and a half. And, you know, if we could get some of those messages um, where people could know very quickly, like, for example, in my office, I would like to see somebody come and set up a system, hydroponic system, where I could have four park choice, go in there, and, uh, you know, things like that. People really, as, as a lecturer, I understood very early on because of my own ability to get bored very quickly that nothing beats hands-on, nothing beats seeing the thing right there and the, and the, and the training and communicating where it unfolds before your, your eyes. And I think that is, a, that is a part of agriculture that is still unattended to, the, the how how to do it, because most of us are confused about this thing, about the, the fertilizers look pretty, yeah. this one is blue and this one is grey and this one is pink, but I mean, it, it, it means nothing to me. How much to put, how often to put it, uh, do you need to put it every time you see something um, affecting your, your, your pak choy or your pimento or whatever. I think in communication, there is, there is that, that opportunity that still, um, still exists, and I think for entrepreneurs, that is a space that I, I would encourage you to go into. Um, I think Tony touched on it, but the other space that is, that is, um, is untapped is on this issue of nutrition security that I've been speaking about. Because I myself um, observe people, and I've been around the country, and I'm a fan of the markets, of, um, the traditional markets, and I always watch to see 
how people make this decision. And of course, the average Trinidadian goes on a Sunday morning to the market to buy exactly what they've been buying every Sunday for the last 40 years. Two planting, a, a dashing, kalaloo bush, a coconut, a pimento, a piece of pumpkin, a hot pepper, right? Um, and we've, we've made some, we've made some assumption based on myth and old talk and all of that. Uh, like, and, and the place it confronted me was on, on some provisions, because everybody was talking about cassava. And I asked myself, I wonder, why are we assuming that cassava is good for you? And what about dashing in relation to cassava or sweet potato or, or whatever else? And um, after, after observing it, I, I engaged the, the assistance of a, a young nutritionist uh, who, um, who I now speak to on a monthly basis, and I'm speaking to her today, to guide me as minister on what, what was really the right food choices for Trinidadians to be, to be making. Um, I was happy to learn, for example, that cassava is on the, on the far end of desirable. Um, dashin and sweet, don't take my advice. Eh? Dashin and sweet potato might be in the middle and green fig is the most desirable. And the irony is that green fig is being given away for two dollars a pound in the market. I don't take my advice. I was happy to learn a number of things. I think the most important thing for me, I think Mr. Ramisa, this is your area, right? So tell me when I'm going wrong. Um, that everything in eating has its, its limits, a, a fistful of this and a handful of this and all of that. But vegetables, there's no, absolutely no limit. You could eat it at midnight, two in the morning, so, and that works very good for, once it's not fried. That works very good for the business I in. Um, I found that very important, and I found it very important that as a minister, I, I understand these things. And, um, and that person who is having this conversation with me, of course, um, will become a celebrity because I expect to put the person on the road talking to the country about the, the, you know, the, the right things to eat. And um, we've, we've taken the same approach with school feeding. It's not just local, it's having the right um, menu, the right combination, and of course replacing the imported content with local content that is desirable, not, not local content that is undesirable. So that is a space for, for young entrepreneurs that you want to get into, into um, because no matter what, I'm sure you know, if people like Zamir taught you as well as he taught me, there's a, there's a price point where you'll always have a, have a buyer. There are niche markets in which you'll, you'll always have a buyer. And the, the, the advantage for young people uh, techno, uh, savvy with the technology, very innovative, and with the ability to communicate is that you could reach into those spaces where the traditional farmer has absolutely no interest. The traditional farmer is happy to be wholesaling to the middleman and continuing the cultivation. So I close by saying congratulations to all of you. Um, the sacrifice, I, I believe it's one day a week still. The sacrifice of one day a week is a sacrifice for you and for your families. I think it's well worth the effort. Um, for UTT and, and um, Atlantic LNG, I know you don't spend money wastefully. And in UTT's case, your, your government has been calling upon you to, to, um, to raise, raise your own money to fund these programs. I think, however, that this investment is, is worth it. I think the graduates, as they go along, will demonstrate the extent to which the country has benefit. I will continue to support this program personally and drive it, especially on the areas of Northeast and Southeast. 
and I thank you for continuing to invite me, despite the fact that the first two occasions I was on no show. I'm happy to be here. I wish you best of success. Um, I will continue to support you once you don't believe that success in agriculture requires a five-acre plot of land. Yeah. And once you take the country into a more sensible, sustainable approach to this business of agriculture. Thank you.